ठीक है Those are people who are liking you. Okay. So can you hear anyone? No. Just ting ting. Right? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. So then why are you going live now? No, because people will join. No? Hi. So I'll uh, begin now. Uh, this is the Anhad Virtual Seminar Music and Poetry Series, started by Anhad. Uh, it's been going on for some time, and this is the ninth part of that. Uh, large number of people have been speaking, music has been coming uh, on this program. Uh, so you know, let's hope that. I am grateful to Anhad for inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, this is a part of the whole day uh, virtual seminar in a sense where we'll be talking about... Hello? Okay, okay. Yeah, one minute. So now that the fan has been uh, put on low, let me continue. Uh, today's topic for the entire day is lockdown and after economy, condition of migrant workers and failure of the state. Uh, so I'll be speaking now and then following that Anjali Bharadwaj, the well-known um, lawyer will speak, then Professor Atul Sood from JNU, the economist will speak, then Kavita Krishnan. Uh, human rights and civil rights, uh, you know, uh, uh, person 
she'll be speaking so we'll have these talks continuing through the day uh, what i will do is to you know uh, present uh, my uh, slides uh, unfortunately i can't show the slides but i'll have to just uh, uh, read from them uh, and the title i've given is lockdown and after economy unorganized sector and the way forward uh, i have been focusing on the unorganized sector uh, a lot because they constitute 94% of the workforce and they are the poor in the economy and they get hit very badly any time anything happens uh, i have been writing on uh, the subject you know since uh, march beginning because i have been uh, feeling that the things are going to blow out of uh, hand uh, so i have many articles in the wire hindu uh, india legal and so on you know uh, details can be, uh, you know obtained from there because what i will be doing will be a very uh, short presentation uh, only so uh, let me begin by saying that uh, you know a friend of mine who's an architect he called up you know the day uh, the lockdown was implemented and said arun how is the economy running when most people have not been working uh, under the lockdown so uh, you know i answered by saying look uh, you're right uh, there are empty roads closed markets uh, decline in consumption of diesel electricity by around 30% drastic fall in air and water pollution and all the economic activity has largely stopped uh and this is not only true for india but for all the economies that are under li- lockdown now this is the difference uh, between what china faced and what the rest of the world is facing now uh, when china went into lockdown in january it was the only country that was under lockdown other countries were still working uh, but now simultaneously large number of the major economies are under lockdown uh, whether it be the us the U- euro uh, zone whether it be britain uh, india and uh, many countries in africa like south africa and so on so uh, there's a huge amount of uh, disruption of trade the wto has said that uh, the trade will be down this year anywhere between 12% and 30% so in a sense uh, you know it it's affecting all the economies of the world simultaneously and that's why projections are uh, that we are going to go into a deep recession uh, and what i have been arguing since early march is that uh, we are going to uh, have a depression rather than a simple recession uh, so at the moment except for some essential production uh, everything else has come to a standstill so the question is what does lockdown imply for society and that's what i'll try and answer uh, in this talk situation today is worse than in the world war or during the global financial crisis uh, nothing like what we are facing today uh, globally has been faced uh, earlier uh, during a war for instance you know the production does not stop it is only reoriented to war production uh, people uh, do not uh, you know get unemployed in fact because of the war effort there's full employment and the demand is full so this situation is very different where you know we find that the demand has completely disappeared and supply has also uh, you know stopped because production has stopped so both supply and demand have been uh, affected uh, so in a sense what you find is that supply has frozen demand has drastically fallen and except for the medical emergency uh, you know that started it now we also have an economic emergency so both these things are interlinked because you know of the medical emergency the economy has been put under lockdown and that's what we need to understand what are the linkages between the two so the question arises why a lockdown you know uh, and the answer is simple this virus is highly infectious unlike ebola and the uh, you know sars and so on which were not so infectious even though the mortality there was uh, much higher uh, here britain said okay the virus is going to spread let us have herd immunity uh, let everybody get it 
uh, and you know uh, they had to reverse that very quickly because large number of people started falling sick and you know their hospitals started getting choked up uh, the US also because Trump first uh, poo pooed the uh, attack of the virus so the US also started late and now the US has the largest number of cases and uh, their hospitals started getting overwhelmed fortunately the peak was reached early and therefore uh, in New York City the hospital still had capacity uh, but India doesn't have that kind of a capacity. So even if suppose we assume that only 2% die if we leave things uh, as they are and uh, don't go for lockdown, uh, then at an optimistic uh, estimate of 2% people dying, 27 million people will die in India. And because our hospital facilities are very poor, uh, medical facilities are not available very much, like for instance, uh, you know, uh, testing facilities are not there. If 5% of the people who become severe cases, they die, then we are talking about 65 million people. And that would lead to social chaos and societal breakdown because hospitals will not be able to cope with the problem that is there. So in a sense, because of our medical facilities being inadequate and testing being inadequate, we don't want them to be overwhelmed and societal breakdown to take place. So therefore, lockdown becomes imperative. Lockdown only buys time. It's not that it prevents the disease, but by buying time, one is trying to prevent a societal collapse. So uh, till a vaccine or a medicine is discovered and testing can be ramped up, that's the time that we are buying using a lockdown. The second uh, purpose that is served by the lockdown is that we are keeping the peak below the medical capacity. If the peak, what is called the apex, if that number rises, uh, rapidly and uh, crosses the medical capacity then the medical facilities will break down so societal breakdown will also take place so in a sense you know uh, we need the lockdown so what does lockdown uh, imply lockdown implies that the poor and the marginalized get hit very badly because during lockdown very few people are only those who are working for essential services and essential production only they can come out you know and, uh, you know, this uh, reduces the mixing in the population and therefore reduces the, uh, you know, rate of propagation of the disease. But its impact on the poor is that they earn daily and buy the essentials daily. They cannot stock up. And therefore, as soon as lockdown comes, their income stop and they start to starve. And therefore, many have decided to migrate from, uh, uh, you know, urban areas to rural areas from where they had come earlier. And the situation is quite desperate and because of that, you know, uh, because of that uh, desperate situation, you know, they're willing to walk even thousand kilometers. They're walking with the, the little bit of load on their head and without food, hoping to get food wherever they go. Uh, they're walking, you know, in very, very difficult circumstances because they have been saying that if we have to die, it's better that we are with our family rather than die alone. So this is the situation in which the poor people uh, are, uh, you know, now finding themselves. And it also shows that the fear of death due to pandemic has now entered everybody, including the poor. And these people, when they go back to the villages, they're unlikely to return soon. Because at least in the rural areas, they feel that they may get food, which they may not get here in the cities. Because cities, the distribution of food has not been up to the mark till now. And that's why we see the data that has come today in the papers that under MG and REGS, the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, the demand for work has shot up in Rajasthan by a factor of 10 and in, uh, you know, uh, Maharashtra by a factor of 2.5 within days of the lockdown being uh, lifted and the second uh, phase of the lockdown having started. So what are the imperatives of the lockdown? We have to be clear if the lockdown has to be successful, people have to stay where they are and stay in isolation. But lockdown is very difficult to implement in India because of the poverty that exists. And now we are paying for the unequal system that we have built in our society. Poor who live in very congested and uncivilized conditions, they find it very difficult to isolate themselves. They find it very difficult to feed themselves, to stock up on food, etc. So in a, in a poor area like in Delhi, you know, one can see easily five people living in a room. In Bombay, it is reported that there are 10 people in a room of 10 by 10 because they sleep in shifts. Now that everybody is locked down, it's very difficult for them to even survive. 
So the poor people living in very, very uncivilized conditions, they are finding lockdown very difficult. So for lockdown to be successful, we need several things to happen. First is that essentials have to be provided to everybody uh, who needs them, you know, especially the poor people, the 94% of the workers in the unorganized sector. Second is we need to decongest people. You know, we need to use the empty schools, the empty colleges, the halls that exist in various areas and decongest people, allow them space so that they can have more space. Uh, now, all this is a very difficult situation, you know, but in a crisis, one has to do difficult things. We, we cannot say that we cannot uh, decongest. We cannot say that we cannot provide essentials. The entire administration should be put to doing these tasks. So I think it, it can be done. If we have the political will, then we certainly can do it. And that is what is necessary. So let us try to understand what is the problem with the economy which is bringing us into this kind of a situation. A modern economy has a huge division of labor. You know, there's a lot of specialization. So whatever we use at home, we don't produce most of it. You know, we don't even uh, we can't even produce a spoon if we wanted to do that, you know, uh, much less, you know, other things. So, for instance, even in the rural areas in village life, uh, the earlier self-sufficiency is gone. Uh, even if you want to, uh, you know, sow your fields and produce a crop, you need fertilizers from outside, you need pesticides from outside, you need implements from outside, etc. So the village life, which is much simpler than the urban life, uh, even there, you know, now there's uh, relatively far less self-sufficiency than used to be the case earlier. So whatever we produce, we go to the market and we exchange that, you know, whatever I produce, I need something else. So I exchange that with what somebody else produces. And for that, I use money. So this money is the medium by which I exchange whatever I need. And how do I earn this? I earn this by doing some activity. I may be a trader. I may be a banker. I may be a teacher. And in that, I, you know, uh, earn an income from the work that I've done outside the home. So it's very important to realize that when work stops, income stops, you know, and we are not able to produce anything. And that is where, you know, the problem arises. We are not like Robinson Crusoe, who was marooned on an island alone and he had to produce everything himself. If we had to produce everything ourselves, the life would be very rudimentary because we had to, you know, uh, produce the food, get the water, uh, take care of the house, uh, whatever kind of house we have, take care of other necessities all by ourselves. So this division of labor that has taken place uh, in society uh, potentially can produce large number of things. But in a lockdown, production completely stops. So therefore, we are not able to get the supplies that, you know, we need to run a modern day life. And that is where the problem begins, that uh, modern day production is further concentrated in some pockets, which are themselves widely dispersed. They are factories or, for instance, uh, food may be produced excess in Punjab and Haryana and UP and may be transported to other states, which are deficit states. So everything is produced in a concentrated form and then transported and sent to other places. So uh, in a sense, uh, how do we do that? How do we uh, produce in one place and distribute to everybody else? For that, we require finance, we require trade, we require transportation. And today, these are all global supply chains. So even big nations are not self-sufficient. For instance, China has become the biggest hub of global supply of most manufactured items, you know, electronic items and various other things like toys, etc. And these hubs, you know, once the, 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 the supply chains get disturbed, production everywhere gets disturbed. So in a modern day society, when you have a lockdown, that is when the problem begins to take place and a lot of uh, manufacturing then comes to a halt. A lot of services also come to a halt, even though some services can be produced uh, you know, from home. So when we are producing, what do we need? We need un inputs. And when we have inputs, we produce. And when we produce, we stock up. And these are called inventories. Now, inventories have a financial cost because... We have to borrow the money from a bank and then build the inventory. Okay. And what we do is when we, uh, we sell our product, then we can repay the, the amount of money that we have borrowed from the banks. So in a supply disruption, what happens is when the lockdown takes place, the production stops and immediately the inventories get blocked. And when inventories get blocked, then, you know, the, the cost of the, the holding the inventory that starts rising, you know. Uh, so in a lockdown, two things happened. First, 
workers cannot go to work the machines and they cannot go to offices to work there second the supplies of inputs are disrupted so production largely stops even though workers and capital both exist production completely comes to a halt so now in the, in the world economy we have production that is carried out by the large scale and the small scale but in india we also have the medium scale and the cottage sector or the unorganized sector so working capital is needed to buy raw materials it is needed to buy inputs and to pay the workers their salaries so in a sense what we need is a lot of capital from the banks to continue our production uh, so that we can uh, hold the inventories of raw material we can hold the inventory of finished product and then sell those things now when that process of sale and purchase that go stops then the working capital gets blocked in addition all businesses to start require loans to be taken from the bank to set up the factory to buy the machinery etc so in brief not only is capital required to build the factory or the office etc but also for working capital so most businesses work with a lot of debt and on that debt they have to pay interest whether they produce or they don't produce you know so this is where the problem comes that when the interest is paid by the firms how do it, does the firm paid by selling its goods on which the revenue is generated when sales don't take place revenue is not generated and interest cannot be paid by the firms you know so that is where the problem begins of mismatch between what is being produced and what the interest so when the suppose the company you know even though uh, suppose the demand is not there but the production continues so what will happen because sales have stopped what you will see is piling up of the inventory of the finished product that means more and more working capital is required so more and more interest will have to be paid and therefore the losses of the company will start mounting so either it will have to stop the production or curtail the production drastically when inventories begin to mount because the working capital shortage will take place so there are different kinds of companies there are healthy companies which have big reserves and therefore they have to uh, you know down downsize the reserve what is called dis saving they there will be dis saving hmm? then there are the weak companies or the smaller units which have very little reserve or no reserve at all but they will also have to dis save or they'll have to default on loans and therefore they can lead to failure and the cottage sector which i was mentioning that uses its own savings to do the production it doesn't borrow or even if it borrows from some private lenders at a high interest cost then it is further stuck up but even if it's using its own savings then what happens in a uh, in a lockdown is that it needs those savings to continue consumption so therefore it eats up the working capital and therefore again the cottage sector gets into problem and what happens as far as the banks are concerned banks get their funds from the depositors okay the depositors have their savings which they put in the banks and the banks then pass that on as working capital or as loans to the businesses you know so the banks are using the savings of the people to pass them on to the investors but when they don't get interest payment back or their loan is not returned then they start losing reserves and that is also dis saving so you can see that in different forms there's a huge amount of dis saving taking place whether from the companies that are well run whether there are companies which are weak whether it's the cottage sector whether it's the banks etc everywhere that there's a dis saving that takes place now what about investment working capital is a part of the investment of the business you know and that is why production continue when the working capital is there so investments in some sense are more crucial than consum consumption as far as growth is concerned so investments when they drop when working capital drops investments drop okay and then the growth falls so production is what results in people earning wages businessmen earning profits and in 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 a lockdown both stop and that is why the demand from workers falls the demand from businessmen falls and that's why production capacity becomes idle what we call unutilized capacity and therefore when you have unutilized capacity why would you invest if you can produce 100 cars but you're selling only 50 cars then there's no need to put in money to uh, invest in another 20 cars and in the indian economy as the rbi data had shown the the uh, uh, unutilized capacity has fall, been falling so what you find is only 70% capacity utilization way back in uh, october december uh, period and now because production has stopped you know our output is less than 25% of the total so unutilized capacity would be some like 75% now when unutilized capacity is so large investment would not take place 
when investment does not take place then what happens is that the demand further declines so both investment and consumption decline and this is a vicious cycle in which you know you begin to uh, see that you keep on losing uh, you know uh, your your demand in the economy which leads to a further fall now look at the savings what are savings savings are the balance of income left after consumption so i earn some money and then i consume out of that and whatever is left is my saving so if incomes collapse so do savings collapse you know and in addition as i was saying to the dis saving that is taking place so what is happening is that consumption has to continue of the essentials but the production has already dropped so the entire population therefore begins to dis save you know because they are using their past savings to do their consumption and therefore the deposits in the bank start declining and simultaneously because investment has fallen and demand uh, for production has fallen so credit demand from the banks falls and that's why you find the rbi is complaining that the banks have parked 6.5 lakh crores of deposits the uh, in the rbi because they want to earn some uh, return on it from the rbi so that they can pay the people who have deposited the money so in a sense <clears throat> banks are also in trouble so everybody starts dis saving except those who are producing the essentials now if if you understand this that the banks are only putting their money in the central bank rather than giving it out as loan because there's no demand for loan then you realize that why central bank policies fail globally all central banks are trying to flood liquidity into the market they are cutting interest rates but as long as businesses are shut they don't need more credit and therefore the policies fail so rbi's policies are also failing you know they are trying to reduce the reverse repo rate which means that you know they are going to pay less to the banks so as to encourage them to give more to the businesses but that will not work because businesses are not working and therefore they don't need the loan so the lack of demand for credit okay is a important thing and this is why we see that in spite of liquidity flooding into the market trillions of dollars being released into the you know the economy by the us by europe by japan etc you know you find that the there's no boost to the economy and the economy is declining everybody is speculating that we are headed towards a depression even the chinese economy which has recovered from the the, the pandemic you know saw that the in the first quarter there was a minus 7.5% rate of growth in the economy so even those economies which recover they are also not able to you know uh, uh, have a positive rate of growth those economies which are in lockdown will have an even worse rate of growth because they have simultaneously got into the problem so central bank policies will not be able to help boost growth now let us look at the impact on the unorganized sector which i was talking about earlier so are the unorganized sector and the poor you know they are sort of coterminous they have low incomes and low savings as i was saying earlier and therefore their consumption falls drastically you know uh, if they don't if they're not given food and essentials by uh, the government then their consumption becomes a uh, you know uh, they, they begin to starve so that's why the reverse migration as i was saying earlier from the cities to the villages is taking place and this is a result of the model of uneven development which we have been following which has forced people to migrate from their rural areas to the urban areas and this will have to be reexamined after the pandemic is over but the point is that the cottage sector producers which exhaust their savings in a short while they will not be able to restart production after the you know pandemic is over and many others in the unorganized sector who are self employed like say a, a small uh, rehri uh, patri wala or a, a rickshaw puller or a barber or a thela pusher even they will find it very difficult to uh, continue their work uh, after the pandemic is over let's look at the organized sector because that's the other component of the economy the organized sector produces 55% of gdp and the unorganized sector produces 45% of gdp so in a sense the organized sector is the bigger producer in the economy even though it employs only 6% of the workforce now organized sector employees they, they have been uh, told that they have to continue to pay people their wages so even though that's not entirely true because we are getting reports that they are firing people design uh but suppose that was to be true that the government continues to pay salaries and the you know private organized sector continues to pay salaries uh then these people in the organized sector with fixed incomes they will get at least some part of their salaries if not their entire salaries but they will be able to continue their consumption of essentials they are the ones who are holding 
And that's why shelves of essentials all over the world in the markets, etc., they're going empty. And that is creating a problem for the unorganized sector people because the prices of essentials have risen in the urban areas because of this hoarding tendency that is coming from the well-off sections. Now, how are the companies going to be able to pay some part of the salaries when the production has stopped? They are going to dissave out of their reserves. And this cannot be sustained for long. This can be done maybe for a month or two months at best. But unless production revives, you know, this is not going to really continue for a very long period of time unless the government steps in and gives subsidy to the uh, organized sector producers also. The self-employed, the elderly, the retired, etc., they will continue to eat in into their savings. As I said earlier, they'll be dissaving by all these people. The small savers who invested in the stock market in the last uh, three, four years because they had very little option of uh, alternative investment and the bank interest rate had come down, they have suffered heavy losses and a lot of their assets have simply evaporated. Uh, this is going to create what is called the wealth effect. When you know you feel that your asset values have dropped by 20-30% and let me say that the real estate prices will also drop very sharply in the coming uh, years because you know the economic activity will go down and there will be a lot of vacant property for which there will be very few buyers. This wealth effect will lead to the well-off sections also cutting back their expenditures and that will lead to further fall in demand in the economy. So we have we see that the demand fall will be both from the unorganized sector and the organized sector. Okay, now the impact of this will be that businesses which are already stressed and as you know, the Indian economy was rather stressed already by January, February, the rate of growth had fallen below 5%, you know, uh, and there are a lot of NPAs in the system. And because of the NPAs, you know, uh, what was happening is that the banks were, were getting stressed and so on. So many businesses which were already stressed, they will now face failure. And in this, those firms which are highly leveraged, that means they have a huge amount of borrowing compared to their equity, they will be the first ones to fail. Many of these firms will be in the financial sector. So the financial sector firms uh, who are highly leveraged, we saw earlier ILFS failing, uh, PMC Bank failing and the Yes Bank, etc., you know, in trouble. So all these uh, financial sector uh, category uh, firms, uh, they will begin to fail first. And what happens in the financial sector is that one, when one firm fails, then the people from whom it had borrowed, they begin to fail because they don't get uh, their loans returned. And therefore, when they fail, other fail. So there's a lot of interlinkage amongst the financial sector firms. And these firms uh, begin to fall like a domino effect, you know, one after the other, they fall. Uh, so that is something that is very likely to happen uh, in the coming months. You know, uh, the only thing that is there is that the government has given a three month moratorium for payment of interest to banks uh, that will help the middle class in their EMIs that can help the small businesses. But the, it's not that the interest is being waived. The interest will keep accumulating. And if production does not start, as I was arguing earlier, then to mount and people will you know again begin to see much failure in the economy so a revival is very uncertain because of the lack of working capital in the system because you know the banks will be very worried to lend to the weak firm because they are already have high npas their profitability is going down so they don't want to create extra npas so government will have to step in and provide the working capital to small businesses cottage industry and so on otherwise uh, things will uh, become problematic. Only those businesses which have large reserves, they'll feel less of pain, but even they will suffer losses uh, at a very large level. Now, let's look at other than businesses, let's look at the other sectors, you know. Uh, the main sector which is of very great importance at the moment is agriculture. This is part of the primary sector of agriculture, mining, forestry and logging and fishing. Now, these are done in a dispersed way, unlike in factories and offices where people work in closed environment, where isolation becomes difficult and where testing is not very uh, robust in India. So they'll be finding it difficult. But it's possible to continue agriculture, mining, forestry and logging and fishing uh, because here, uh, you know, you can work in a very dispersed manner so that, you know, social distancing and physical distancing can be maintained. But the problem that will arise is that as incomes of the vast majority of the people decline 
And let me say the, the agriculture sector is only 14% of GDP. The primary sector is only about 18% of GDP. So these are rather small as far as the total demand in the economy is concerned. So when incomes in the remaining sectors, they decline, that the demand for their produce will also decline. So like happened during demonetization, agriculture prices fell very sharply because the demand from the unorganized sector uh, declined very dramatically. Now there's an additional thing. Even if they produce, you know, how will they get their product to the market? And that is something that they're already finding very difficult. You know, uh, what will happen is that uh, without trade and transport, the farmers are not able to sell their produce. And that's why you have reports of fruits and vegetables rotting in the field. You had the BBC showing that in uh, the USA, uh, many farmers are simply plowing their, uh, uh, th their crop into the field because they're not able to sell. So in India, what you will find is that, you know, the uh, people in the rural areas, if they're not able to sell uh, in the market, then, you know, uh, they will find the prices crashing. But in urban areas, there'd be shortage of these things because they are not moving into the urban areas. And that's why in the urban area, the prices will rise. There'll be a lot of profiteering because of the shortages that have got created. So there'll be a need to regulate trade. Uh, this will be very cru crucial. That's why I've been arguing that the problem that comes, you know, is both in the rural areas and in the urban areas. And there's one solution that's possible. And that is government must procure everything that is being produced in the rural areas. In other words, its procurement program has to be widened, not just a few crops, but all the crops that are produced, the vegetables, the fruits, etc. They all have to be you know, procured, whatever can be stocked because these are perishable. So you need cold storage for stocking them. Uh, if you can stock them, stock them, but otherwise bring them to the urban areas and supply that in the urban areas to people where they are. And that will also help in the, uh, in the lockdown being, uh, you know, uh, properly implemented. If people have to come out to buy supplies, then, you know, the lockdown will be very difficult. And how, can, how to do this? I've been arguing that the entire administration, apart from implementing lockdown, should be uh, put to use for procurement and for uh, public distribution. And large number of public transport buses, trucks, etc. are lying vacant at this point. So they can be taken to the rural areas and from there the supplies can be procured and taken to wherever people are living. So like in Delhi, 5,000 DTC buses, say 500 buses at the airport, you know, many trucks, they are lying idle at the moment. They can be utilized so that minimum number of people are used to take the supplies from the rural areas and bring them to urban areas so that by and large, therefore, the lockdown can be implemented. Now, what will happen as a result is the lockdown is likely to be extended you know it can only be relaxed in stages as testing capacity uh, in india is low at this point of time so unless we build up the testing capacity if, if we open up prematurely and yesterday uh, the the the, uh, the editor-in-chief of lancet was saying that all the work that we have done in the first round of lockdown all the benefit of slowing the spread of the disease would be lost if we again begin to have a wider spread because we have prematurely opened up the economy, you know, and that will again mean, uh, you know, that uh, things will uh, fall apart. And not only that, the good work of the first lockdown would be lost, you know, because in the second round, there could be a much wider spread and many more deaths that could take place. So lockdown has to be relaxed gradually as testing capacity builds up. And the lockdown has to be properly implemented by providing essentials to everybody. If we are able to provide essentials to everybody, then I think it will work. So at this point, we will see that the recovery will be very slow. The recovery cannot be very fast. Some people have been talking about a V-shaped uh, recovery. That means as quickly as production fell, the production will rise. That's not going to happen because the consumer sentiment is down. And as I said earlier, capacity utilization is down. And when these two are down, neither consume, consumers will come out and consume more, nor will the investment take place because capacity utilization is down. So if consumption demand and investment demand is down, and if exports are also down because the rest of the world is in lockdown, then there can't be a V-shaped recovery. There can only be a gradual recovery. I'm only reminded of what my neighbor told me three days after the lockdown. He said, Arun, I didn't realize that we can live with very little. We don't need to go to malls. We don't need to buy uh, so many things. We don't need to spend so much. And I think that will be the, the situation for a lot of people who are fearful of what the pandemic is. And they're not going to suddenly start going and doing it. So 
what will happen is that employment and incomes can only recover gradually in what is called a u-shaped uh, thing but as a result as i was saying earlier businesses which have exhausted their working capital or where which have failed during lockdown they'll not be able to start and therefore the recovery will be very slow banks will be very wary banks own financial conditions will deteriorate as i was saying earlier and that will add to the problem of a quick recovery so what will happen to the rate of growth of the economy you know in in this uh, year 2021 you know the economy is working at less than 25% at a very optimistic uh, estimation uh, agriculture some primary activities some essential so less than 25% of the economy is working and that's what you know your your decline in energy consumption decline in movement etc that all suggests that the economy is really really running very low so from this suppose you assume that in a year's time and this is a very optimistic guess the economy recovers back to where it was in january uh, 2020 you know then it means that the rate of growth of the economy at the present is minus 75% it will get to 0% by say january 2021 in that case the rate of growth of the economy will be less than minus 35% you know because you know it will gradually recover back to where the output was which means that the economy would lose an output of about 70 lakh crore and gdp would therefore come down from 200 lakh crores last year to about 130 lakh crores this year so this loss of 70 lakh crores will be largely of the workers and the small businesses etc so what you uh, will find is you need to support these people and if you want to support them then you have to do additional expenditures uh, for them otherwise the lockdown would not work in addition we require huge investment in our health infrastructure and in tackling the disease so expenditures will rise so in other words unless we tighten governance you know we won't be able to deliver so in addition we have to tighten governance so where are the government's resources you know where where will the government get these resources that are needed so you collect taxes both from incomes and from production and consumption what you collect from incomes are the direct taxes what you collect from production and consumption are the indirect taxes so tax collections will collapse if your gdp falls by some like 35 to 40% then the tax collection will fall far more dramatically because most of the gst is collected from those items which pay either a high tax rate okay or they are sin goods you know and those are the inessentials so their production will fall and the essentials don't pay gst uh, very much so therefore gst collections will fall to maybe about 10% of uh, uh, what uh, it was this year or, or, or what it was last year and because corporation will find that they'll be running at a loss the corporation tax collection will fall income tax collection will fall so last year we collected 16% of gdp as tax collection this year i think it will fall to about half to roughly 8% of uh, gdp so last year we collected about 32 lakh crores between center and states as taxes now this will be down to about 10 and a half lakh crores so we lose about 22 lakh crores worth of taxes so this loss will be which mean that we will not be able to meet the current level of expenditures of government you know so all that we can do in this kind of situation is give a survival package and take care of the health infrastructure everything else will have to be uh, curtailed so government expenditures uh, which are committed like interest payment that you know how we will continue that that's a big question we certainly have to curtail salaries defense expenditure travel meetings and all these things will have to be curtailed if we are to make do within the resources that we have public investments can be postponed and new projects shelved to reduce expenditures certainly the grandiose projects that you know <coughs> the government has been thinking of so the deficit of the government will rise because the tax collection will fall expenditures are not falling so if we don't cut the expenditures then the fiscal deficit would be 15.5% of the reduced gdp but the deficit will rise further because you know we are losing 20 lakh crores worth of uh, tax collection so if we don't cut expenditure then there'll be another 70% increase in the fiscal deficit now if we increase expenditures on health then that will raise it further and the deficit will rise even further and if we are to sustain half the population at half the world bank poverty line of dollar 1.9 then we need an additional 15 lakh crores of expenditure this 15 lakh crore of expenditure we can subsume the subsidies you can subsu subsu subsume certain other expenditures that are done on the poor and yet this will not be sufficient 
So therefore, the resources of budget will be adequate only to give a survival package. There is no space for a stimulus uh, package at all. This survival package will be where the poor people are maintained, the small businesses are maintained and you know uh, we give the essentials to everybody in the economy. Just this is the survival package. Our resources, the government's resources will not be sufficient for anything else. Even if we borrow from the RBI, that's only uh, basically deficit financing, you know. So as I said, the deficit will rise to much above 30% of GDP, of the reduced GDP because of all these requirements. And for that, we'll need resources from the RBI. We'll need, you know, to borrow from the wealthy people uh, because the tax collection will fall dramatically uh, even from the wealthy and the corporate sector because of the losses that will take place. So in conclusion, Today, machines, factories and offices exist, but the economy has stalled due to lockdown. The poor and the unorganized sector producers who have little saving will need support and we need an expanded PDS for that to, uh, to happen. And therefore, the, the lockdown requires an extended public distribution system to take care of the large number of the poor and the unorganized sector in the economy. We need to step up the health infrastructure immediately for instance, today we don't have enough uh, hospital beds, we don't have enough doctors, uh, we don't have uh, machines you know, to take care, we don't have testing. All this needs to be ramped up. I've been arguing that we should use uh, schools and we should use other halls, etc. to set up facilities in case the disease gets out of hand. Uh, as I said earlier, even to disperse the population, you know, we need to use the schools, etc. to disperse the population from the congested areas so that lockdown can be implemented. So all that would require to be done. Uh, government's resource position is badly stressed and can only cater to survival and no stimulus is possible. Businesses are asking for GST cut. If you cut GST at this point of time, it will have no effect because businesses are closed and you will lose further revenue. So your deficit will rise further. So therefore, a GST cut or a tax cut at this point is not feasible. And if we are to give a stimulus to businesses, that has to be done only after businesses start. At this point, it will not help them uh, uh, very much. So today, the problems that are being confronted are a result of very uneven development of the country. And therefore, once the pandemic is over, I think a basic rethink is required about the development paradigm, uh, which you know we are functioning with, which is creating the large amount of problem for the economy, for the poor people, for the unorganized sectors. And when we rethink, we'll have to rethink of the nature of trade, the nature of openness of the economy, the impact on the environment, you know, uh, travel and so on. So thanks very much for the you know attention and thanks uh, uh, for listening to me. Uh, I'm sorry, you know, I think I took a lot of time, uh, but maybe it was worth it. Uh, thank you very much. Bye. Uh, there is a question about stock market while the economy is almost down to zero. Do you think that some uh, of the group are... Uh, uh, manipulating it. Uh, you know, the stock market very often uh, does not have much link with the immediate economy. You know, you, you saw that, you know, the uh, situation is so bad that uh, all commodity prices are declining. In fact, oil prices turn negative uh, for future delivery. Uh, so uh, what you can find is that a lot of the time, uh, you know, the stock market is not reflecting because the speculative activity, people are in uh, putting in money on speculative basis, but that doesn't reflect what is going on in the real economy. Uh, ultimately, as the economy does not recover, I think a lot of uh, st stock market will also decline very dramatically. Uh, so, you know, I, I think we have to be very careful about the stock market. A lot of people have lost a lot of wealth. Thanks.
No, I think it's not a good time to invest uh, Ravin Kundu's question because uh, we don't know where the economy is headed, how bad it will be. Uh, you, a V-shaped recovery is not likely. It's likely to be U-shaped. So, you know, uh, things cannot, uh, you know, uh, be certain. So don't invest. Uh, keep liquid. Uh, that's why, you know, people say that when uncertainty is great, then liquidity has to be maintained rather than being invested. You know, uh, you could make a lot of losses at this point. Of so don't uh, don't think of investing in the stock market. I think it's done, huh? I think messages are coming, no? Yeah, so you can answer questions. Ah, I've answered whatever I could. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Hope it's very informative. <laughs> Let's hope so. Yeah. Huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank you. Bye.